Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the long anticipated Direct Force Pro Wheel System from the guys at Virtual Racing School, sporting the tried and true Midge 20 Newton meter servo motor that is custom spec to VRS's design requirements, and providing a nice, simple to use wheel tool for tuning duties. This looks to be a very promising direct drive force feedback system. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Now let's take a closer look at what you get in the kit. First we'll take a look at the controller box itself, which is a very small unit. This thing comes in at, I think it was 100, 180 millimeters as far as the width this way, which would be about 7 inches, and 160 this way. And that comes out to about, uh, about six and a quarter. And of course, it's only about two inches tall, which would be about 50 mil. Yeah, 50 mil. So again, a very small box, but a very nicely done box here. Uh, it's got a good professional feel and finish to it when you bring it, when you first unpack it. So yeah, it's like I said, it's, some things when you take them out of the box, they radiate quality. And that's what this does. Uh, they've done a good job with this. Uh, it is a steel metal type of enclosure and of course we have a logo on it and you can see there's a lot of ventilation for the electronics inside we have ventilation on the top we have it on the sides and yeah so that should be plenty i suppose this actually has a 400 watt power supply in it and also the other supporting electronics for driving a servo motor and yeah got a logo on the front and on the bottom we've got some rubbery feet and some more vents and I'll show you the label. I can get to where you can read it there, my bright lights. All right, Direct Force Pro. So on the back is where we do all the connecting and nice connectors here. You can see we have gold plated pins here for the power plug. And over on the encoder, we've got a 15 pin plug and we have this emergency stop. And right now the, in the emergency stop has a loop plug. And that plug has two wires in it. You can see them there. Is creating a loop so that it just stays on and without this on it won't work properly so you have to have this plugged in for it to work and we'll talk about that later too uh, usb b type port the usual stuff we see here a nice little reset button and we have a 115 volt mains plug here for north america and of course our switch right now, you know very compact uh, very simple you know not much to to look at as far as what you're going to be hooking it to there are some threaded holes here, so you could, I don't know if you could use that for a mount or not because it's only right there. I guess if you were hanging it or something, you could do that, but I would think that you would need more screws, threaded uh, holes in here to mount it, which if you have a thread kit, you could always put them in yourself if you needed to, but yeah, you could mount this. I mean, it's small enough. It's got some, a little bit of weight to it though because of the power supply and stuff in here, I imagine, but we'll do a, once we get to the look inside, we'll be able to see this better. So yeah. I like this box, nice and compact. And of course, we got the midge motor. And this is a small midge, as we've been we've been calling them for years, which is a max of a 20 Newton meter on this midge motor. And they actually have midge make this motor encoder set up uh, special for them. And there's some electronics on the back here. And I'll probably pull this off and show you guys that once we get to that point. But uh, there's a couple of extra sensors in here and switches, or a switch and a sensor, I believe, on the encoder that helps them better control the motor itself. Right. So, yeah, midge motor. What could, more could you ask for? This thing is, I can't think of anything that's more tried and tested and <laughs> proven to be a very robust motor. In fact, I've got another one over here that I've had for years, and it still runs great. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure this, maybe there's a few of them that broke down somewhere, but we've been using these motors in the direct drive type of configuration for years. I can't imagine how many tens of thousands of hours people have on these for direct drive use. So, yeah, I think it's a smart move on their part to go with a known proven motor and just not mess around with other motors. Plus, I really like that they went with this servo motor instead of a stepper motor. Right, but we'll again, we'll get a little more closer look at that. We also get these cables. Now these cables are custom made by a third party company that was explained to me. And we, what they do is they get the connectors that come with the midge motor from the factory. 
And then they send these connectors off to someone else, a third-party cable manufacturer that custom makes these. There's supposed to be some uh, ferrite chokes in here and some shielding. They call it double shielding uh, for the all the cable here. And so we'll take a look at that. This is the power cable, and that's where shielding is usually the most important. And yeah, so we'll take a look at that once we take a closer look at these uh, cables themselves, unless it's really easy to pull this. Well, let's do it now. <laughs> let's see what we got. Let's see here. Take our little cable gable off. Oh, yeah, there we go. How about that? We have a shield cable. You can see the metal shield there. And we have a wire attached to that. Oh, that's showing up in this light. Let's see if I can get this thing to focus. All right, so there it is. And that's going over to the ground pin. And if you also see in there, you see that little ring looking thing there? That is actually a ferrite core or choke, as we like to call them on the parts of that wire. So it's shielded there, so the other side of this wire should have a shielded wire also inside of it attaching to the ground part, right? So we have a ground on all the shielding throughout this cable. You know, it's very cool that they're doing this. More and more manufacturers need to start doing this on their sim racing peripherals. I mean, we're paying a lot of money for the, these uh, accessories, and they're still... Um, manufacturers who leave their electronics just hanging out in the breeze. You know, maybe a piece of plexiglass on top of it or something like that. And that's really not good for um, even just having a, a direct drive motor. It's an electric motor and it, and it produces EMI and RFI and it can affect things. And yeah, some of these manufacturers, pedals and stuff like that, they're still just putting their, <laughs> I just don't get it, their circuit board just hanging out. <laughs> So it can be affected very easily. And load cell circuits are, are more prone, it seems to me, than potentiometer ones to the EMI effects of electric motors. And, you know, as much as you pay for those kind of things, you expect to see this kind of stuff, some kind of a shielding, or at least an effort for shielding. I think uh, the effort for shielding in some manufacturers, they throw a, a piece of wire in there and say, hey, if you have any problems, put this to a, run this to a ground. <laughs> so it's kind of silly, really. But as more people get into motion, that's going to be even more of a problem that manufacturers are going to have to deal with if they don't address it in manufacturing. Okay, enough about EMI. We have two connectors over here, and one is for the power. We saw this will be the female part of the power plug. You see that's all gold-plated, too. I meant to mention that on the box. And even their 15-pin unit here is a gold-plated unit. Very nice indeed. Again, going the extra mile here, I think. The cables feel very substantial in hand, and... I don't think, uh, let's see if there's anything on here that says it's 22 gauge. Okay, so we got 22 gauge strand wire in here for each of the wires running through here. Looks like a max of about 300 volts. That's a lot of volts. Okay, so what else we get? This is an accessory. You don't get this with your kit, but it's nice. Now, this is obviously a hub adapter, and we're going to need some weight, obviously, to take the input out of the shaft and put it on our steering wheel, and this is what this does. And you guys may have seen stuff like this before. This is an aluminum, CNC cut aluminum anodized unit, black. Very nice. It, it kind of dresses up the image a little bit too, instead of just having the silver stuff out there. This will slip all the way on there like that. And yeah, I kind of like the way that looks. All right. So not much to this. It's a clamping style. So this, you can see this slot in here that runs the whole length. We're going to have two bolts in here that we tighten down and it will tighten down onto the shaft. And before you install something like this, or any hub really, not just this one, uh, you want to make sure you clean this shaft off good with some rubbing alcohol or some degreaser that will clean it off good because you want this to grab well. And of course, run do the same thing inside of here because there might be some manufacturing lubricant or something in there. I don't know though, but after anodizing, I wouldn't think they would put more lube on it, just for the heck of it. You already got the alcohol out or whatever. So, nice little thing. This is actually $50. Now, you can get other clamps. Now, this is a 22 millimeter shaft, by the way. All the, the midge 20, uh, small midges have that, 22, that's, and that hasn't changed. I measured it. But you can see on my older midge here, I have a more of an industrial looking shaft clamp, and you can still order these. I think you can get some on eBay or some other shops in different places sell them. And the clamp itself is this part right here. You're still going to need this adapter, though, that has a 70 millimeter pattern on it, all right? And it has holes in it so that these four bolts here don't interfere with anything. So you're going to need something like that to adapt it. And these these run anywhere, I've seen them like $20 to $25 or even a little more for this adapter. So 
25 for one of these or $50 for one of these, you know, and uh, considering the whole kit's only $7.99, I think I would be, personally, I would get this one because I think it just looks a lot better once it's on there. And of course, it's got the threaded pieces in there, right, for your, your screws to go into. That way you can see that threading in there is tapped. And it's a 70 millimeter pattern. This is not threaded. So you have to run some bolts and nuts and things on it. So again, a little bit more convenient and you pay a little bit more for that and a better looking thing too, I think, as far as aesthetically speaking. All right, so let's get our motors out of the way here. We'll look at those again a little bit. Now you also get an accessory here. Well, you don't get this, this is an accessory. This is the mount for the motor. I think it goes like this with the flanges would be on the outside, kind of like this, right? And then, if we can hold it still, we've got the front mount plate that comes in like this. All right, and it's got these slots in the bottom so we can adjust our angle. All right, so it'll just fit in here like this or in between these guys, really. So if I can do this without dropping them, making a bunch of noise. There we go. Something like that. All right, and we do get a hardware package to attach all that right here. Nice black bolts, right? Even the nuts are black and the washers are black in here. So again, it's the little touches like this that kind of stand out against some of the other kits that I've seen before. And this has a VRS, I don't know you can see that, logo cut into it on the side, on the top pieces. So it'll be kind of like this, like that, I guess. Yeah, kind of going down. <laughs> All right, and again, this is powder coated. I believe this is steel. And well, let's find out. Where's my steel measurer? <laughs> yes, steel. So yeah, good steel plate here. And just a good looking kit, really, from what I can see so far. All right, let's talk about the USB cable that comes with it. And this is a trip light, which is some of the better type of USB cables out there. And it has the gold plated, well, you can see this, ends on both ends, right, from our USB B and our USB A. Very nice. Only thing that I would like to see changed with, now they actually told me they've tested these cables in and found a cable that met their standards. And that's great. I'm glad they went to the, the extra effort to do that. So they went with the trip light brand, but I would still like to see some ferrite chokes on both ends of this for the EMI. And I have ferrite chokes. I got a bag, a box of them, different sizes. So I usually put those on there and they're cheap enough. You can buy like a sorted size kit for like, I don't know, 20 bucks and you'll have like 50 of them in there. So yeah, I'll probably put some chokes on this cable myself. Right, last but not least, you get our power cable. And this one has the usual three, three slot connector on the end of it. And, but because this came from Europe, I have the European plug, which is no big deal. I have a lot of these plugs for 115 volt or cables rather, so no big deal there. But yeah, this came from Europe. And currently, as I'm shooting this video on the 22nd of May, 2020, they are not shipping to North America yet, but should be by the end of this month or the first week or two in June, they'll be shipping these units to North America. And the connector on that power cable will be the correct one for North America. All right, so that's all we get in this kit. And yeah, it's pretty complete, I think. I'm not really wanting for anything, although you, you do have to get the bracket extra. And if you want this hub, you'll have to order that extra, which takes the price up to from $7.99 to $8.99 or 900 bucks. Right. So what we'll do next is get to our closer look individual stuff and like, like look inside and things like that. So let's take a look inside of this controller box. As you saw before in when I was showing you everything included in the kit, this is a very small box to do what it does. It has plenty of ventilation on it. As you can see the innards inside of it from all the holes here. And we even have ventilation coming in the bottom and on the sides. We have some very nice gold plated power connector right there, a 15 pin over here. Our e-stop again, which is has to be in, which is just a loop back, if you will, a little loop plug so that this will work. Our USB-B, our reset switch, our mains power in, and of course our switch for turning it on and off. So I've already taken the screws out. Let's see what they're doing in here. Get this out like this. There it goes. Okay. Nice, heavy metal. This is like steel, powder coated steel. Yep, it's steel. And has a nice powder coat finish all over it, including the insides, except where these screws are going in. All right, so 
Here we have, first off, the power supply is sitting back here. And this is a Meanwell power supply. See if I can get that in there so you guys can get a look at it. You see the model number there. Okay. So this is a 400 watt power supply. It does 48 volts out at 8.4 amps. And yeah, using a Meanwell power supply is always a good idea. They're kind of the industry standard for uh, power supplies for quality type of power supplies. And of course, this is a fanless unit, so there's no fan in here. And we can see there's a very large 400 volt capacitor hiding under there, right? We've got some more capacitors over here on the output. And there's our output lugs there for the power to go to our controller board, our driver board, if you will. And you can see those capacitors in there, the smoothing capacitors. And as the power comes out and goes into our board, then we have some more smoothing capacitors over here, right where our power output is. We also have this big gold resistor, and this is a Dale 50 watt. You guys see that there? Breaking resistor. So yeah, nicely done on the power supply. You know, there's no fan, so this is a very quiet controller box. It'll never spool up on you. So that's nice to know. And this is their custom controller driver board. And I'll get you a close look over here. You can see the down here in the corner, or up there in the corner, rather. It says VRS, Direct Force Pro. And there's the version number of this board. Very nice and neat, very tidy inside here. I like the way the connectors, you know, they've got all the shielding in here. Everything's done as far as you should see in a professional product when you take it apart. And, yeah, it's just well done everywhere. All the terminations are good. You know, they've, they've done all these like they should be done. All of our connectors everywhere, including the mains up here. The connector block going to the board. It's a cool little connector block there. You see this little orange thing on the back? That's the locking mechanism for pinching down these wires inside the block. So, yeah, very cool. We got some jumpers in here. Um, you don't need to use jumpers when you update, update the firmware on this board. It's just uh, you can do it through the application that we're going to see when we get over there and we're driving it. So, yeah, very tidy, professionally done board. I really like this. And it's so small. I mean, this thing is, I can't believe how small they've gotten these things these days. I mean, it used to be, you know, big boxes that we had to be able to run these, uh, to these 20 newton meter small midges over here. So, yeah, they've uh, really come a long way with this. And they've, they've done their homework, like I said uh, before. It took them like a year and a half to bring this thing to market. So, yeah, I think it shows they really took their time and got it right. I mean, I can't find anything to complain about in here. So yeah, there is our look inside of the Direct Force Pro controller box. Let's take a closer look at the Midge motor that VRS is using in their direct drive system. Now, I have another Midge over here that I've had for several years and been using it in different configurations as far as for, you know, OSW and a couple other custom boards. And yeah, it's, it's kind of an industry standard. It has been for a long, long time, these uh, Midge uh, what we call 20 or small midge motors and they are proven again i think um, vrs was smart to go with this because it's a proven you know it's got tens of thousands of hours on it as far as how long people have been using these things in a direct drive configuration so there is a difference here there's only one difference actually between these well two actually there's a model number difference here but yeah other than that they're the exact same they have 20 millimeter shaft or rather 22 millimeter shafts on both of them so anything that would fit on the older as far as a, a hub adapter or a, a shaft clamp, whatever you want to call it, will fit on this one too. So first thing I'm going to show you is the new one that VRS has had spec'd by Midge. And they are not light motors. So I'm going to show you the label there. And you can see it says DFP for Direct Force Pro. And there's the model number. All right. And this is a 2015 edition. So I have a, a later edition over here, actually. So that's really the only difference between these two motors. I'll show you the, the one on this old Mitch that I have. And this is, um, what's the number on this? This is 2008. I think that was 2015. And other than that, you can see the model number is different here. So they have changed the model numbers a little bit, but there is no DFP on this one, of course. Right. So that just lets us know that, again, VRS has this one spec'd out exactly like they need to have it spec'd out to have it in their system. And we're going to next take a look inside, which is basically just pulling the encoder cover off and see what's hiding underneath there. Now let's take a look inside the midge motor. 
I've already taken the screws out of the encoder cover here. Now remember we have some wires in here obviously because we have the data plug sitting up here. So we have to be careful when we open it up. And there's a rubber gasket also that tends to stick to the housing. So you just want to be careful and make sure all that comes loose so you don't have any issues. And I'll just kind of rotate this out of the way so we can see what we have here. All right, so the first thing we see is the BIS encoder, and I'm going to go ahead and get you guys a little bit closer here so we can see what's going on. So this is the BIS-C encoder, 4.1 something million uh, resolution. So again, a very good encoder on this. Now, there's actually two different things here that you won't see in a regular MIDGE motor, and hence the DFP designation on this motor from MIDGE. First thing you see over here is an air packs thermostat. Basically, what it's doing is reading the temperature of the motor. All right. And that's just, these are safety measures this are, that they've actually gone and had Midge add to these motors. Over here, we have a switch. And this is a thermal switch. And it's got this, this epoxy or something on top of it. Basically, what this does is at a certain predetermined temperature, I'm not sure what that is for this motor, but this switch will actually, there's two pieces in here, two metal pieces that are making contact right now. And at a certain temperature, those metal pieces will actually expand enough to break that contact. And when that happens, the motor will shut down. So this keeps it from having any kind of thermal overload. Again, a safety, a, a safety thing, if you will, uh, that is normally not on the midge motor. So yeah, thermostat and a thermal switch over here are the two things you won't see in a normal midge motor. So yeah, other than that, yeah, not much to see here. Just got some <laughs> wires coming out of here. It's the extra wires, of course, for these two extra safety measures. So yeah, it's nice to know that they're in there, huh? So not much else to see, obviously, on an inside look on a midge motor. So <laughs> we'll just move on to the next segment. All right, guys, just a short little clip here to show you we have everything mounted up. Everything is nice and firmly mounted up because you know how stiff these P1Xs are with these motor mounts. Everything's cabled in good, and it's kind of looping under the monitors back here and going up to a little piece that I have up here from Sim Labs that you can bolt to your profiles that I use a piece of Velcro there to kind of manage my cables a little bit. Still a, a long ways away from great cable management, but that's just what I have to live with here at the SRG because I'm changing things around so much. Right, so there's our controller box, and we'll go around and have a little peek at that. This little guy sitting here, and... There is a little bit of warmth coming off these holes in here, but yeah, not hot it by any means. It's just uh, kind of nice because it's cold in here for my air conditioning. <laughs> so my hands uh, can detect a little bit of heat there, but that's of course the power supply is running now. And we'll go ahead and come around the side here. And yeah, very neat and tidy the way they did this. You know, the cable connectors are nice metal pieces as we saw before. Just everything goes together so well. We've got a green and yellow light on our e-stop loop back plug which means everything is golden and of course we have our usb and our mains over here yeah really not much to it so all we have to do now is get in and start driving this thing here is the vrs wheel tool and we'll be using this to obviously tune the force feedback of our wheelbase and it's a very simple looking tool which is kind of a welcome sight to me personally um, and don't get me wrong, it's nice to have a slew of different filters and adjustments to make on a wheel if, if that's what you're into and tweaking to the, the last little bit. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there who don't want to have all those options and want something a little bit simpler as far as their GUI. And this is what that is. So, of course, the wheel itself has to be able to deliver a good force feedback experience with less effects or less uh, control or tuning options. So we'll see how that works once we're driving it. All right, so... First thing we've got the VRS Direct Force Pro wheelbase here is a drop down menu. Probably, I'm guessing, because there might be future hardware developments from uh, VRS. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. We've got some tabs here reload our settings, save, factory defaults, bootloader mode. Of course, that's for updating the firmware on the wheelbase. You can add profiles, remove profiles. So basic profile management up here. There is a drop down for your profiles, and if you can see, I'm going to drop this down. I've got a few profiles already, three in iRacing and one in Assetto Corsa. So it's nice to be able to easily navigate to whatever profile you need and click on it. If I wanted the Lucas truck, I could click on that and it would change to what that was, right? I'm going to leave it on the floor, 88 GT3 for now. Now, down below that, there's a center button, which is nice. You just 
load the wheel up, center it up, and not load the wheel up, but you center it up, and then you would press the center button. Well, currently I'm on 900 degrees, Mach force is 60%. Of course, we can take that all the way up to 100% if we want. So yeah, uh, I was running at 60. I've been trying a lot of different settings on this. So that's why it's sitting at 60% right now. And over here we have where we're actually going to be doing the tuning with some slider adjustments. And we have three tabs up here, force feedback, encoder, debug. This is for force feedback. Encoder is dialing in the encoder that we have on this, which you will probably never change. And that's the BIS-C REV. And of course, that has a resolution of over 4 million. So very good. Debug is where we can actually start logging. If we're having a problem you know, with the wheel or the system some way, then we can actually log it and send it to VRS and let them take a look at it and see if they can fix it for us if there's an issue. So back to the force feedback. Pretty simple stuff here again. Smoothing filters. I currently have mine on two. And it goes to one and then zero. And I think I've actually never gone past two, three. It'll go up to four. Okay. So you can go up to four there. And smoothing is just uh, the, the ramp, you know, in our racing, let's take that example, 60 hertz signal. Uh, it can, it actually just kind of smooths out the, the ramp of that signal, the sine wave that's, that's coming out. So it doesn't cut off the peaks. It just smooths up the ramp up is the way it was explained to me. So yeah, it works. I can tell you that. Um, damping. 10%, I can go all the way up to 100%. <laughs> I don't think anybody would ever use that, but uh, 20%, 10%, depends on what you want. Now, if I go to the default configuration, I'll hit default, and you can see it's 100%, and the smoothing is one, and that's 10%. That comes out of the box from VRS, and you can just tune from there, which is you know very cool. We also have friction, inertia, and spring effects. And I've played with that a little bit, but I got a pretty good feeling uh, on the one that I have from my Ferrari 488 here at even just using 60%, uh, smoothing to dampening 10%. So, and I'm, I don't have anything of friction, inertia, and spring. And it's kind of an ongoing thing too. I'm playing with things. Depends on the car and the track you're on too. You might want to play with some of this. Now, you're probably looking at device effect only. What is that? Well, there's a drop down here. And it's device effect only, game effect only, and device and game defects. So what this is, is device effect only means that this motor and the software and the firmware is just going to be reading the telemetry stream off the game. All right. So we're not paying attention to the any canned effects that might be coming out of whatever game or simulator, whatever you want to call it, that we're playing. And you can change that. If I was in a set of Corsa or Project Cars 2, I might want to go in and do game effect only, or I might even want to combine the two device and game effects. Right. So it just, just gives you choices for how the wheel will feel and what effects that you want or don't want uh, coming to your wheel as far as the force feedback cues. So it does give you some options there. And of course, it's all the same on all the rest of them too. So this is going to be a short little clip because, well, that's about it. <laughs> There's not much else to do here. So I, again, I, I kind of like this. You know, it's, it's very simple, intuitive, and yeah, it just gets the job done quickly. And being able to do it quickly gives us more time to spend actually driving than messing around with all the different things that we can do, like in some of the other direct drive wheels out there. But again, it only matters. It's only a good thing, rather, if the wheel can deliver it using these type of, of just these few di different adjustments we have here. And like I said, we're going to get into a driving uh, session and we'll see just how well it does that. So we're going to be doing a live tuning session just to see what the different effects or different adjustments as far as the effects go to our force feedback on this wheelbase. And we're going to go to the default, in other words, out of the box configuration that comes with this. So we're going to go with 100% max force, smoothing is at 1, dampening is at 10%. Friction, inertia, and spring are at 0, and we're on device effect only on all of our settings. Of course, the only one that we should be feeling, because all the rest are off, is the dampening, and of course, the smoothing is at 1. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and save those, just make sure they are the effective ones. And we'll get in here to iRacing, and I'm going to make sure that I'm at 19 newton meters. I remember peak force newton meters is 20 on this wheelbase, but I usually put it one newton meter less than that. It's just a practice I got into a while back because it, it, it seemed to work for me and I just kind of stuck with it. And our strength is going to be 7.5. Of course, I can adjust that in the car any, to tweak anything that I want as far as the force goes. This is going to be pretty strong right off the bat. We'll go ahead and jump in the car. A little doubt in my mind. 
this is probably not where I'm going to end up. And I have my black box down here set for force feedback strength adjustment on my wheel here so I can just turn the dial and change it. So let's see what this feels like right off the bat. Looks like the sun's starting to set here at Sebring. Yeah, that's, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> and I got the volume down on the car. Hopefully that's not overwhelming my voice here. I'm pretty sure it isn't. Yeah, so I'm going to go over some curbing here. And I'm watching my, my meter up there for the force feedback, see if I'm clipping anywhere. And there's a little clip right there. Now, of course, I, I'm not going to be driving like that at speed and when I'm trying to compete. But it's good to see where... I use that as a judgment on where my clipping is. So if I'm only clipping on the curbing, then I'm good to go everywhere else on the track. Man, 100% is... It's manageable at 7.5. Remember, our force feedback is only 7.5, so... That's why it's, it's manageable, but I wouldn't want to run it like this all the time. Yeah, that's a bit much. Let's see what this does. Yeah, okay, so that's a bit strong, even at 7.5. Now, I've got two choices here. I can go change my force feedback strength down here to 6.5, and that might do it. But I'm also going to watch my force feedback dial up here just to see how much less force feedback I'm getting because I've turned that down now. It's kind of a dance here. Yeah. So there's less, less force in the wheel now, but I, I don't seem to be getting the spikes I was before, even though this curbing isn't as uh, massive as the others were. That's pretty good there, these, these rumble strips. Yeah, you can definitely see that, at least I can see it. I don't know how well as you guys can see it, but and good rumble strips, though, right there. Very good rumble strips. So definitely less force feedback from the game being output. So what I'd rather do, instead of that, is go ahead and stop here. We're going to get out of the car, because I'm going to change it in iRacing as I change it up here in the in the what I'm calling the driver, which is the wheel tool. And I'm going to take this to 90%. And this is just a strength adjustment. I haven't tuned anything for dampening and smoothing yet. And I'm going to save those settings. And then I'm going to get back into options here. And of course, if I'm at 90%, that's 10% less of maximum. So I'm going to put this down to 18 newton meters. All right. So done. Easy enough. And I'm leaving it at 7.5 because I don't want to mess with that just yet. That'd be like my final tweak. All right. Well, let me go back up 7.5 where it was on my direct force feedback there. There we go. It was at 6.5 because I've changed it. All right. So. Back out on the track, looking for some curbs to abuse. Ramming curbs is so much fun. <laughs> yeah, already I can tell this is this is a better setting for me personally. And again, remember, all this stuff couldn't be more subjective. <laughs> it's just a process that I go through with my wheels when I'm testing them. There you go. There's. Yeah, see, I got some yellow, almost red there on that bump, on that curbing. So this is, whoops. <laughs> You also have to pay attention to what you're doing on the road. <laughs> so I've got a feeling this is pretty close to where I'm going to be as far as strength goes. It feels good. The wheel actually feels pretty good, and I haven't changed anything yet. It feels just a little bit, I don't know, notchy, very reactive. So a little bit notchy there. So what I'm going to do is, as I continue to try to get it dialed in, I'm going to go to smoothing. I'm going to put that at two instead of one. So remember, that's supposed to put a curve on the, the, the sine waves that we're getting. Oh, come on, slide over here. There it goes. <laughs> it wouldn't slide there for a second. Just wasn't doing it right. All right, so now we're at two. So we're smoothing out that uh, 60 hertz curve on the ramp up. So let's see how that affects anything, if anything. Yeah, already it's affecting. Yeah, that's much better already. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's still got the detail there. Yeah, I'm liking this. Looks like two might be my smoothing setting. Well, if I can keep it on the road. <laughs> there we go. All right. 
hard to do the tuning and talk and uh, concentrate what's going on in front of me too. I forget how fast I'm going. <laughs> All right, so we're going over this curb. Yeah, that's good, that's good. All right, so the smoothing really changed it. I could tell right away that works in a good way. Of course, again, somebody might not mind a little bit of the, the sharpness there, what, almost like a notchiness, but the, I'm going over these curbing slowly so I can feel what they, if I'm, I still have everything there, and I do, very good. Yeah, very good there. So all this is good. All right, so we're at two, we're at 90%, and I'm still at 7.5 in my force feedback strength and eye racing. So I'm gonna go try something else here. What I'm gonna do now is go to device effect only. I'm gonna go to game effect only. And I'm doing it under dampening, so I'm leaving the rest alone because I'm not using those. All right, we're down our long straight here. And this is smooth straight, so there's really not much to tell me about what's changed or hasn't changed. But right off the bat, it feels like the strength has changed a little bit. So according to what my understanding is, now we're only on game, obviously we're still getting telemetry, but we're on game effect mode, and it definitely is different. It's, it's less force, not much, but a little bit. I can, t I can tell it. A little bit less force. And it, it's, the wheel's not as active either. Yeah, it's, it's less active. So that's game effect only. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not crazy about that. But let's go to game device and game effects. See what that does. All right, here we go. Let's see what this does. Okay, the strength is back. And it's active, much more active, it feels like. Let's see. I mean, I can't say that right now. Let me, let me go uh, over some bumps here, curbing and stuff. Yeah, that's good. This is actually not too bad. Yeah. It's, um, it's smooth, but strong. And there's a lot of detail. And we'll do some more of that as we get through this hairpin. Over the dirt here, my usual path. And we'll hit this transition from asphalt to concrete. That felt good and smooth, but it was there, immediate, immediately there. That's, actually, this is not bad. Yeah. This one. Force feedback uh, meter up there is good. I haven't, I clipped off that bump a little bit, but that's okay. It's not, nothing wrong with that. Actually, I like this. Huh. Hmm. Okay. So, there is an effect change there when we blend the two. But I'm going to go back to just a device only. Save it. And... Make sure, <laughs> because you know it's easy to forget while you're doing these tuning sessions where you were. I mean, even with just these few settings that you've got to mess with, it's easy to forget. You know, oh, where was I before? Where I really liked it, and I was, then I kept turn, tweaking it, and I messed it all up. That, that feels good. Yeah, it's so much like the game effect. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't think. Um, boy, it's hard to tell. That's how close it is. It's just hard to tell. So I'm going to leave it on device, I think. I think that's where I'm at on the Ferrari here. So 90% with 7.5 in the force feedback strength. Maybe I might tweak that later on. In fact, let me tweak it now. I'm going to take it up another to 8.5. See how that works. Let's get some speed up here for this bumpy curve we go around. Hit speed. Get off in the dirt. It actually feels pretty good too. I only put went up to eight five. Over the bumps. Yeah, this is pretty good. I'm still looking up here for my clipping and I just got some red going off that the bigger bump. So this might be pretty much where I need to be. Yeah, 
Yeah, nothing there. It was, it was, I'm getting full force feedback, but I didn't get any yellow on that. See how our bump. Yeah, good bump cross there. It's one of my favorite bumps on the track for testing things. Oh, look at that. I actually picked up some speed. <laughs> I haven't been going that fast. Though. Yeah, I got some yellow on that. Should get a little yellow here. Yep. Okay. Wow. Actually, I kind of like this. I might, it depends on the length of the race I'm in, I might kind of go in between that, 7.585 at this particular setting. And I'm sure there's somebody, I just got some actual red and yellow coming over that bump. But again, the object is to not be on the curbs, right? <laughs> but I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to say this is completely wrong, and I don't know what I'm doing, but hey, it's all personal preference, you know? You like what you feel or you don't, it's just it's the way it is with this stuff. But we can see that there's plenty of adjustment in here to get a, a good feeling in the wheel. So well done to uh, VRS, the guys at VRS. That's why I guess it took them so long to get this wheel out. They worked on it and worked on it for over a year and a half, I think. It's, and it's really paying off here for them. It, this wheel feels really good. I could, I could use this wheel and have no problems if this was my only wheel. It's, that's, yeah, it, it passes my, my uh, test for that. And again, I would go in and save this configuration you can see the other ones I already have in here. And, and just, you know, like, again, I might tweak it for a different track in a different car. That's what all this is about. And again, nothing can be more subjective than this, guys. But I did want to do a quick driving session or tuning session while I'm in it live with you guys, showing what I'm changing and trying to describe what I'm feeling. And I hope that you guys were able to get something out of this. And you can definitely see what settings I'm using. Maybe you can try them if you have a VRS wheel. And, and tweak from there because you're probably not going to completely be satisfied with it. it might be too strong might be too weak who knows so anyway we'll go ahead and yeah now we can get in and have some fun and just drive we are at sebring in the ferrari 488 gt3 and we are in i racing of course in turn 17 the treacherous turn 17 and getting bounced around a lot here and we can feel every little bit of that in this wheel now first off the direct force pro wheel is a, what I would call a good balance system. It goes first, it starts off with a known entity, which is the midge 20 newton meter or small midge as we like to call them motor. Now this is a tried and proven motor. Now, who knows the untold thousands or tens of thousands of hours people have put on this motor in this kind of configuration as far as being a direct drive wheel. And you know, I, I never really heard of any midges going bad. I'm sure there has to be a couple of them or a few of them out there that went bad, but overall, it's just a, a workhorse. And it's something that's gonna be very dependable for a long, long time. So I think it was a wise decision by the guys at VRS to choose this motor. And then to collaborate with Midge themselves, the factory, to get the sensors and electronics they needed put in that to make it work the way they want to. So yeah, uh, starting out with the motor, you just, you know, you, you can't complain with this midge motor and and there's still plenty of them out there by the way still running in in other systems so yeah it's not like they they went away just because some other systems came out with the latest and greatest stuff but of course a motor is just a piece of the puzzle here putting together successful direct drive force feedback wheel experience and of course we have to have good cabling and it, we have great cabling here as you saw in the closer look or when we checked out the cables where they have all that uh, shielding for EMI in them, uh, built by a third-party vendor. Very well done there. Um, I'm, I'm a big uh, advocate of fighting EMI because more and more people are getting direct drive motors, which is, of course, generating EMI in itself. And people are starting to move to motion solutions, which also you're surrounding yourself with motors, electric motors, and all this stuff puts out EMI RFI interference. So manufacturers need to start taking that into account and yeah it, I'm, I'm really happy to see that they've done that here now the controller backs i really like the little small diminutive size of this thing you can stick it anywhere you want to and hide it away somewhere there's no fan so it's very very quiet and yeah not to, not much to complain about there but of course the internals what really matters is the circuit design and of course the firmware and software to run it all and deliver the goods to our hands through the steering wheel and as a complete package here, this pack, you know, the, the Direct Force Pro just gets it done. Um, it was easy to tune. And by the way, I really like the tuning software they have. It's not overly complicated and it still gets the job done. It it's, was pretty easy for me to come up to speed on this system 
with a feeling that I thought I was getting the max I could out of it. Even though, you know, if I spent, a, you know, it was my only wheel that I used, and I imagine over the time I would be tweaking it a little bit here and there. And of course, they'll have firmware updates and things, so things might change a little bit. But out of the box, this is doing a great job. I was trying to find things to, to complain about, and the only thing I could say is it's just not quite as smooth in the force feedback delivery as my wheel that I used every day. And I wouldn't expect it to be, to be quite honest. Um, and at the price point, this is a very good package. Uh, geez, I mean, it, it's, it's good to be around sim racing these days and watching all this technology trickling down as far as the price point is. I mean, I remember days when, you know, where you had to spend a lot of money to get something like this. Not that $800 is not a lot of money, but uh, yeah, it's, it's still a lot more affordable than it ever was before to get some very good direct drive feedback out of your system. And that's what this does. Um, again, the only complaint I could have is I, I just wasn't able to get it just as smooth as I'm used to from my other system that I use on a daily basis. But other than that, I, I don't, you know, I, I looked around hard to find something I didn't like. And this is just a complete package. It took them a year and a half or so to bring this product to market. And you can see where that time was spent. They, they were being perfectionists. They were, they were picking it apart and then tearing it back down and then putting it back together and testing it. And yeah, they just did a great job here. And I think, you know, how can you go wrong at $800 for a real tried and true servo motor direct drive force feedback wheel solution? I don't know. And, you know, it astounds me that they can do it for this price point and still in the, in the midge, you know, it's got tons of power if that's what you want, or you can turn it down if that's not, if that's not what you want. It's just, just a very versatile system, I think, that a lot of people, and it's good to see that it's gonna be accessible to a lot more people than some of the more expensive stuff out there. And you know what? This, this system is definitely punching above its weight when it gives you the force feedback. And, you know, you can feel everything you need to feel and then some, it's just, it just delivers everything you need to be able to control the car when you're at the limit all the time. And that's what, at the end of the day, any DD system is supposed to do. But yeah, this one does it quite well. And yeah, it definitely gets the approval, the SRG approval <laughs> rating for, for this wheel system. And yeah, even if the price point just makes it all that sweeter. So yeah, I really like this wheel system. Final thoughts on the Direct Force Pro force feedback wheel system from the guys at Virtual Racing School. VRS has been developing this system for well over a year. They were not in a rush to bring it to market and I think it shows in the final consumer product. Out of the box, it has the look of a professional bit of kit, and it doesn't stop there. The circuitry in the controller box is well done, with an obvious attention to detail, and sporting a 400 watt mean well power supply, which also indicates the care that was used in selecting which electronic components to use. The custom spec midge motor that VRS has made for them sports some extra safety features not found in stock midge motors, which is always welcome when it comes to using these powerful motors. Speaking of which, I think VRS made a wise decision to go with the 20 newton meter midge motors. It is a tried and proven unit that has seen tens of thousands of hours in the hands of sim racers over the last few years. Nice to have a well-known dependable motor in your direct drive wheelbase system. The Direct Force Pro also comes with some nice custom-made controller cables. Using the stock aviation-style midge connectors, they are made by a third-party vendor that uses a properly shielded cable and goes the extra step of installing ferrite chokes in both the power and data cables. EMI is a real concern, and it's nice to see manufacturers taking steps to mitigate this potential problem. Another plus for this system is the easy-to-use Wheel Tool app. That comes with the unit. Easy to use with a nice balance of tuning options that made it easy to find a setting that suited my driving style without spending a lot of time testing a long list of filters and other options. When driving the system, I was able to feel road textures, rumble strips very well, and it was easy to tell what the car was doing in time to make correcting inputs and get my usual lap times. There is no e-stop switch available yet, but I'm told that there will be one available soon. There were two accessory items included with my review unit, the VRS motor mount bracket and the combination shaft clamp wheel hub adapter. 
This system is selling for $799, but if you get the hub and adapter and the motor mount, it will cost an additional $100. Overall, I like what the guys at Virtual Racing School have come up with here and can certainly recommend it if you are in the market for a direct drive force feedback wheel system. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.